Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk from Kali and a couple of VMs to Next Gen Home Lab, an approach to practice and develop my skills. My name is Bashar, and I will be a presenter for today. Here we go. Perfect. I know you can't wait to hear this talk, but let me first introduce myself. My name is Bashar, and I'm a member of a blue team at the Fortune 100 company in Houston, Texas. My current role focuses on threat intelligence, threat hunting, and vulnerability management. I have worked previously in different industries for different service providers. I have also consulted on many engagements and projects. I have a master's degree from University of Houston, along with 4GX certifications focusing on digital forensics and incident response. I am excited to share my, how I built my home lab with you all today. I have a different approach and hopefully you will leave this talk with a lot of ideas that you can use to build your own lab. Before we deep dive into this topic, I want you to keep in mind that this presentation is about the journey to build the lab. The goal is not just to build the lab, but rather it's about everything you are going to learn along the way. Hopefully the ideas that I will present to you today will spark your interest and encourage you to dig deeper and continue the journey. Because there will be no one specific destination or one specific way or path to build this lab. Having a home lab will allow you to explore and develop new skills in various areas. So by now you might be wondering, how can a home lab enhance or improve my skills? Research has shown that we actually learn more by doing. Your likelihood to return information is much higher when you're actively doing the concepts or exercises that, you, that are presented to you versus, for example, reading about something in a blog or hearing about it in an audiobook. When you actually do it, 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 it sticks in your mind. Having a home lab will give you the advantage to practice what you learn and experiment new technologies or even give you access to technologies that you're not allowed to work on at your workplace. Don't let that limit yourself or worry about affecting people's workflow or causing business interruptions. Your home lab is a safe place where you can tear things apart and tinker with them. But on that note, just make sure your significant other or roommate can still access the internet. I can't tell you how many times my wife got mad at me because our home DNS server went down and she can't browse the internet. That's why I wanted to create a completely separate next-gen home lab. So now that we all agree on the benefit of a home lab, let's discuss what a next-gen home lab is. When I started my career, I always used my desktop or laptop with some VMs to test and learn new concepts and skills and probably most of us have well also, as well. That worked for me for a while, but then I realized that I wanna take this to the next step, next level, right? Um, so what I did is I created Next Gen Home Lab, which is basically a lab where I mimic the infrastructure of a small company or enterprise and virtualize it all in one physical box. This allowed me to practice and explore an environment similar to a company's environment, but at a small scale. As you build this next gen home lab, you are going to enhance your understanding of many IT foundational concepts. From networking to virtualization, building a management domain controller, an active directory, uh, Linux administration, the list goes on. This will also help you understand why applications and infrastructure availability is critical for business operations. In my experience, availability is sometimes overlooked by security professionals. But it's something that we should always keep in our mind, is to understand how, to real, how the real world works and how, to secure, how security fits, fits in the overall of the IT picture in an enterprise. So let's start building our home lab. First, we will need the hardware to run our lab on. The beauty of this next gen home lab concept is that you can scale it based on your resources. The more resources you can give your, to your lab, the closer the lab will mimic a real company's infrastructure. 
If you can afford it, I strongly recommend having a dedicated machine to run the lab on with at least 32 gigs of RAM. But if you don't have access to such a machine, it's okay. You can still apply some or portion of this concept to any decent laptop or desktop. Also, another thing from my experience, when using solid state hard drives or NVM Express hard drives, it was worth every penny. It speeded up the deployment process so much because the idea is we're gonna keep deploying more VMs and, and that's time consuming with the normal hard drive. So if you can afford it, please add those to your list. And speaking of resources also, um, most VMs, what I noticed is they would require more resources when they're being deployed. So for example, I would assign uh, a Windows Server domain controller for virtual CPUs and for gig of RAM when I deploy the machine or the VM. But then once I'm done provisioning, I will just drop the resources to about one virtual CPU and one gig of RAM. And that should be the average HVM will need when it's just sitting there idling. Generally speaking though, the heaviest resource consumers will be things like a SIM that's processing events at all time. If you have a packet capture server running, it will also require more resources since traffic is always gonna be floating in our environment. Moving on to the virtualization component of our lab. As you probably know, there are many virtualization solutions out there both free and paid. Since we'll be deploying many VMs in this environment, it's generally a good idea to reserve as much resources as possible to run those VMs. And we can do that by running a bare metal hypervisor, also called a type one hypervisor. I personally like to use VMware A6i, and that's just my personal preference. Uh, even though it has some limitations like a uh, maximum of, four, of eight virtual CPUs per VM and a maximum of two physical CPUs in a physical A6i host. I think the current free A6i features will be more than enough to build our home lab. If you're interested in getting more enterprise-like features from vSphere, things like backups, uh, API calls uh, for automation, uh, using vCenter for cluster management, you can pay $200 annually and sign up for VMUG Advantage. VMUG Advantage will give you access to play with most of VMware products for a whole year. So pretty much the whole line of VMware for a whole year, which is not too bad, honestly. Um, there are also many open source virtualization software like Zen Server, QVM, Proxmox. I have heard many good things about Proxmox lately. Proxmox give you most of the enterprise features in A6i for free, but unfortunately I haven't had a chance to play with it or just experiment with it yet. Uh, lastly, I wanna mention that this home lab can be built using VMware Workstation or VirtualBox, also known as type two hypervisors. Just keep in mind that you will have less resources to use for your VMs since this type of hypervisor will be running on the top of the OS. All right, now let's get to the technical part. Let's start with our home network. Usually there is a modem or router from your OSP provider. I recommend putting a firewall behind the ISP modem so we can isolate our lab traffic. I personally use Unify because they are really user friendly, but feel free to use the firewall of your choice. The goal is to have a mechanism to isolate our lab traffic. In my setup, I tag all traffic from my lab as VLAN 100. I will explain more about VLANs in next slides. I use my home network firewall to block all connections from VLAN 100 into my home network devices. Next, I connected a physical switch that is gonna be the main switch for my lab. So any device 
that connects physically to this switch is automatically blocked from talking to any device in my home network. After that, I built and configured the, the A6i hypervisor. The hypervisor will come with the default virtual switch, which is vSwitch zero. By default, this virtual switch will be connected to the physical network card that is, uh, which will give you access to the management console on A6i. So for our home lab, I will need to add two more virtual switches along with port groups. One virtual switch will act as the one interface for our enterprise, and the other will act as the LAN interface. Once we added and created these V switches and ports, now we can deploy PFSense. PFSense is an open source firewall that can be run inside a VM. In our case here, it will be acting as the edge firewall for our enterprise. One of the nice things about PFSense, it has many packages that we can install easily with one click. We can easily enable a proxy, uh, a VPN server, an intrusion detection system, and so many other features. The, the important thing here is when we connect, when we deploy PFSense and connect it on A6i, we only need to attach two network adapters, the WAN and the LAN that we just created. Now that we have PFSense in place, we will configure the WAN interface as DHCP so it can get an IP address from our home for firewall automatically. I like to use a dedicated network card for WAN so I can manage PFSense on the WAN interface and have a defined WAN zone for our enterprise. You can also use vSwitch zero as the WAN switch if you are limited to one physical card on your host. But for now, I'm gonna stick with the first approach. Next, we will configure the LAN with a static IP with no uplinks or physical cards attached at the moment. So this LAN interface will act as a single backbone to the firewall. Now it's time to set up VLANs or virtual LANs. VLANs will give us the ability to segment networks virtually by assigning a VLAN tag ID to each subnet. This way we can use one virtual switch and define many networks or subnets and this is how we are going to segment our enterprise network. So let's start by defining the VLAN on A6i first. We simply add a port group. In this case, I'm going to create my DMZ VLAN. So I give it a name of DMZ. I give it an ID of 200 and I attach it to my LAN virtual switch. And I go through the cycle as many VLANs as I need. After that, we need to define the same VLAN, but on PFSense. And we do that by adding a VLAN interface on PFSense and give it a VLAN ID tag. So following the same example, I'm matching the same VLAN ID of 200 that I created in A6i in PFSense and give it a name. And then I'm ass ass I assign an interface to activate it in PFSense. Once we activate it, we can add a DHCP server to be defined on this VLAN. So any VM that is connected to this VLAN will automatically get an IP address from PFSense. And in this example, any VM in the DMZ will get an IP address of 10.10.200. whatever is next available. In other words, PFSense is acting as a DHCP server for each VLAN. Finally, we need to add the firewall rule to allow connections for these VLANs because PFSense doesn't do it by default. So just because you have DHCP configured, you still need the firewall rule. Otherwise, that VLAN cannot talk to anyone. And again, we do the same process for all the VLANs that we need. 
uh, we go through the same cycle. So at the end, depending on how many VLANs we want to have, we should have something that looks like this. As you can see, the VLAN tag IDs have been defined on both A6I and PFSense, except for the LAN and the promiscuous port groups. In A6I, when you assign a VLAN ID of 4095, that tells A6I to treat this virtual switch as a or port as, as a trunk port, which means it can receive traffic from any other VLAN, regardless of which VLAN ID the traffic is tagged on. The promiscuous port will be used to get a copy of all the traffic that flows through our vSwitch. This can help us monitor traffic, monitor and analyze traffic in our environment. The promiscuous mode pretty much replicates a, a physical span, tab, or mirror port. And we'll talk about this um, later on. Now it's time to start deploying and building the enterprise infrastructure. Let's talk about the technologies and networks we can build that we usually see at a typical enterprise or a company. Starting off with our servers. This is where will we host all essential servers needed for this company to function. Um, most companies use Active Directory and domain controller in their environments. So let's replicate that and by deploying a Windows server and promote it to be the domain controller and also make it the DNS server for the environment so it will register workstations as they come up. We can easily also get a free trial of Windows 2016 or 2019 from Microsoft. Uh, the free trial can run up to 180 days, which is plenty of time to experiment. Uh, usually I would just get the uh, trial, I'll take a snapshot before I deploy it, and then I can just revert to that snapshot so I don't have to download it again every single time. Microsoft also offers other trials if you want to play with some databases, SharePoint, uh, many more. You can go there and find all kinds of stuff that you can download. And because no company can function without emails, we should add an email server so we can send phishing emails, for example. Uh, Mail in a box is a simple to deploy mail server that runs on Windows. And if you're interested in something that runs on Win, and uh, I'm sorry, Mail in a box runs on Linux. And it's, and if you're interested in something that runs on Windows, uh, you can try Edge Mail Server, and that's also open source. We can also include Linux servers to address some of the other technologies used in enterprises today. For example, um, we can use FreeNAS as our file server. That's where our employees can store and access their files. In addition to the core servers, let's also think about the applications used in this company. Things like the intranet, where users can go and get companies' internal information. You can run an intranet with any open source wiki or WordPress site. Depending on the type of enterprise you are trying to build, you can add an in-house accounting software, for example or an electronic medical records application if our fictional company is the healthcare system. And to make our lab interesting, we can deploy vulnerable servers like with exploitable two or three, uh, OWASP WebGoat. These VMs are vulnerable by design and have many open ports and vulnerable services running. So this is how these VMs would look like in our environment. When we deploy a new VM, we simply assign it to the network adapter in A6i, and it will get an IP from PFSense. And according to the IP and PFSense firewall rules, it'd be contained in that specific subnet. This way, we can easily move any VM from network or subnet to another by simply changing which network adapter it's attached to, it's attached to in A6i. Now let's think about how to secure these subnets. Each subnet will see different types of traffic. Do we allow all traffic to this subnet or should we identify which ports are required 
and only allow connections to these ports. Especially when it comes to Active Directory and Domain Controller, there is a number of ports that should be open company-wide in order for users and workstations to function. The same things applies for databases, uh, file servers, and all the above. Also think about how to manage files permissions. How are you going to make sure certain files and folders are only accessed by authorized users? And another thing to think about is who should be able to access these servers over SSH or, SSH or RDP to manage and maintain these core ap applications or servers. Finally, what's the impact of leaving some of these databases or applications with the default configurations? How can you check if the default admin credentials were never changed? Can you configure the application to run uh, HTTP instead of HTTPS? Why would that be beneficial? Just some ideas to think about. Okay, now we have some servers and applications set up. We will need some users to use these applications and servers, of course. So let's add another subnet, call it user subnet. I usually uh, deploy just Windows 10 VMs using the same link as the servers from Microsoft. You get about 90 days trial with these and the same kind of scenario, I just take snapshots and revert them. Uh, once you build them, it's going to be a lot of work to kind of create a lot of users. So there's a really cool script out there um, which generates Active Directory objects for you. Uh, the script is called Bad Blood, and you run it on the domain controller using domain admin, and it will automatically create hundreds of users and workstations in your Active Directory within like 15, 20 minutes, and you can have a more realistic uh, Active Directory that way. Also, another thing to think about uh, for our users is if we want to simulate these users, um, there's plenty of options. We can use a uh, web traffic generator, which will run as a script on uh, the VM, on the, let's say Windows 10 VM, and it will just visit random sites all the time and generate all of web traffic. The next option up is uh, using invoke users simulator, which on the top of web traffic, it will also uh, it will also run, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it will also open unread emails. So if you send a phishing email to this user and it's sitting in their Outlook, this script will actually read it and execute it for us. And it also will have the user access different file shares that we specify. The last link for a, it's pretty much for a full fledged uh, uh, user simulation uh, called Ghosts. This is going to lead off work because you're going to have to deploy a server, a master server for all the different clients to talk to. But this would, could do pretty much a lot of simulation um, from running commands to set a, to uh, opening documents, creating documents, everything, just like the real experience. Now, since our company keeps getting bigger with more users, we're going to need to hire some IT admins and give them some access to all the servers. We can use a Windows server and add the remote desktop services role so that multiple admins could RDP at the same time. And to make things interesting in this subnet, we can get an older copy of Managed Engine Desktop Central from their archive and we can run it as a free trial for 30 days. This specific software has, is widely used by IT admins today to manage endpoints, but many previous versions of this software is vulnerable and has been exploited heavily. Okay, let's think about how do we allow IT admins now to do their job. One of the good security practices out there is to create a dedicated jump box for IT admins. The idea is 
IT admins should not connect directly from their, their laptop in the user subnets in this example. But rather they connect to a jump box and use that jump box to manage or move around the environment. So with that concept in mind, how are we going to restrict access to the sensitive IT jump boxes subnet? Are we going to do it by username or are we going to do it using firewall rules? Meaning, should we allow certain users to be authorized to log into these jump box servers using Active Directory? Or are we going to enforce access control by limiting which machines is able to connect to these jump boxes? Also, how the boxes in the subnets is able to access the other servers? Should each jump box has two necks? Should we use firewall to restrict who they can talk to? What's the implication of each approach? Which one would you prefer as an attacker? And the last thing is, with all these user machines being deployed, think about how can you harden these users' machines and servers also? Which GPOs do you want to use? Which logging levels do you want to enable? Um, and so on. Now, let's give our company some online presence. So we're going to deploy some VMs in the DMZ. The DMZ was originally designed as a buffer between the hostile internet and the internal network. So what should we build in our DMZ? Well, every company is going to have a website. And to make our website interesting, we can go through the WP scan vulnerability database and find the, uh, a good vulnerable plugin or version of WordPress and use it and install it on our WordPress site to have it be vulnerable. Another thing is if we want to do e-commerce, if our company sells stuff, why don't we use OWASP Juice Shop, which is uh, uh, another application that is vulnerable by design and it's pretty much a store that you go through and buy different juices and fruits and stuff. Um, so that's another idea, another, another good site to have if we want to have something vulnerable. Uh, also, a lot of companies will, will have FTP servers running. Um, this is how they still uh, store files, exchange files their customers or their partners and so on. Why don't we have another misconfigured FTP server with weak configuration? or just run an old software, FTP software on that server and see that as the initial foothold in our DMZ. With a lot of the latest vulnerabilities going on the past two weeks, Citrix, Netscaler, F5, Big IP, what we can also do is we can go to these vendor sites and sign up for an account and we can download actually free trials of this software. So why don't we just sign up, get these VMs, deploy them in our VLAN, in our uh, lab, and put them in this DMZ VLAN to pretty much mimic a real, uh, a real scenario, a real life scenario, and go through, that, go through that. And finally, if you really run out of ideas and you're not, we don't have any much else to deploy, there's always vulnerable hub VMs where we can go, now we'll purposely design VMs, vulnerable VMs, and add them. And again, the, the, the options are endless. So now that we have finally brought in a higher risk subnet into the picture, we want to make sure our internal network stays safe. Many companies implement a firewall between the DMZ and the internal network. But since this is a lab, I wanted to see if I can accomplish similar results using a dedicated VLAN for the DMZ along with the proper firewalls. Things to think about, how should our, admi uh, our IT admins manage the DMZ, which credential, credentials are they going to use, how these connections are going to take place. What if an application in our DMZ uses a database? Where should we store this database? I also wanted to add additional subnets to my lab network 
to make it a little bit more realistic and challenging. The first is an air gap network. This network is usually dedicated for isolating high risk assets, assets that can receive updates anymore or unable to apply updates or patches. These assets are not supposed to be able to connect to the internet. If you have some old copies of Windows XP or 2003 laying around, that would be really cool to deploy in your network. You can also try to find any industrial control system or IT, IoT device simulator. If not, I would just use another Windows VM, 10 VM, without any updates and limit that VM ability to talk to other segments of the network using firewall rules. Another uh, subnet that I created was a VPN connection. So I can connect directly into this lab environment from anywhere I need it to. And I also use this VPN connection to share with other researchers so we can all work together in the lab. PFSense can help you build this easily. Um, we just have to deal a little bit, not deal, but have to learn a little bit about certificates and PFSense made it really easy to do it. I also did create a guest Wi-Fi subnet for our fictional company, since every company is going to have visitors. PFSense also gives us the ability to create a captive portal and guest users registration and tracking and so on. And the last piece is I added a home Wi-Fi to connect directly to this enterprise from my laptop anywhere in my house. So what I did for that is I bought a refurbished router and configured it to act as an access point and connected it to a third physical NIC on the, on the physical host. Since I wasn't able to assign a VLAN ID to the access point, the VLAN tag was automatically set to zero, which means anyone connects to the ASAP will be part of the LAN network. But now the cool thing is, I have a, a Wi-Fi network directly inside this enterprise. So I can just open my laptop, connect to this AP or this Wi-Fi network, and I'm directly inside my enterprise that's virtualized in a box. One more thing is the AP is useful for is if we want to test Wi-Fi attacks, if that's what you're interested in and you want to play with Wi-Fi attacks, that would be a great opportunity to mimic Wi-Fi attacks against our enterprise. Okay, now moving on to the attacking side. If you want to work on your red team skills, you can add an attacker VM or VMs for that matter. I think most of you will know what Kalyonix is, but uh, if you don't, it's an open source distribution that has many offensive tools and scripts out of the box. If you're in, more interested in trying a Windows-based uh, attacking machine, check out Commando VM from uh, FireEye. And if you don't want to do exploits um, or manual pen testing, and your thing is more of, hey, I just want to do some command and control traffic. I want to I wanna send malware and I want to not malware. I want to control it from my VM. Then I would strongly recommend check out Slingshot C2 metrics. It has many different command and control frameworks out of the box, and you can easily spin up the, the command and control server and create your payloads and malware and send it to your victim. Okay, I'm reading the question. Here's a great one to add to your list if you're not with the, when, uh, Okay, sorry, I was getting the uh, question. I got an answer. Okay. We uh, next, so let's talk about the red team. We attach the attacking VMs to vSwitch zero. So in this case, they can get an IP from our home firewall and be blind to everything behind the PF sense. This is how I define the internet zone, which is the zone outside our WAN, but still within our home network. Now we can start attacking all the vulnerable VMs that we have been creating throughout this environment. Let's think about how to attack this enterprise. 
do we scan the DMZ and compromise it first and then move to the internal network? Or do we send an employee a phishing email and have a malware running in their VM and start from the user's network? The possibilities are truly endless. And this is where we really can get creative with our approach. Now we get to into my favorite part, defending and detecting the attacks against our enterprise. In simple terms, we need three core components to detect attacks and attackers. The first component is the logs, things like your firewall logs, your VPN logs. We need a place to collect and analyze these logs. Second piece is network traffic data. This will help us understand how packets move around our environment. And the third piece, and finally, is the endpoint data. Endpoint data will give us the visibility into activities that takes place at the host level. Things like which processes ran or who logged into the machine and so on. So for our, let's start off with our network security monitoring or how we can get network traffic. First, as I mentioned earlier, we will need to attach the promiscuous VLAN port into this VM so it can get copy of the traffic that we want to monitor. After that, depends on what we're looking for, we can deploy Zeek, which is uh, it's an open source tool that's in between NetFlow and a full packet capture. It's been used widely and it gives us a lot of uh, logs that we can look at and see the traffic that happens in our environment. Another option that we can do is Sorkata, which is uh, intrusion detection system. We can't compare it to Zeek, it's, it's different, but it pretty much looks at signatures uh, to detect attacks and abnormal, at unknown attacks actually, or things that we can tell it to monitor. Next up is Security Onion, which combines both Zeek and Sorkata out of the box and many other tools. Security Onion is awesome because it's not a tool, it's a whole distribution, Distribu uh, uh, Linux distro that we can deploy. And out of the box, it has Zeek, Sorkata, and Elastic Stack, so we can get all the network traffic and full packet capture and everything else. So that will be, be an easier route to go with if you want to have something up and running very quickly. Also for full packet capture, I really like Molik. Molik will give us the ability to do a full packet capture and store it in an Elasticsearch database. So think of it as, as, you can, as Wireshark as the front end and then uh, like Elasticsearch or big database as the back end. And you can easily hunt and look for traffic Using Molik. What about our endpoint visibility? We can use Sysmon. Sysmon will give us additional event IDs for Windows. So we can, for example, see which process is a child of which process or which process created sender DNS query and so on. It will give us about 23 event additional event IDs that are very important and help us a lot to get a bit of visibility of activities that took place at the host level. Uh, if you're interested in actually actively looking into a machine and getting artifacts or data from a host, check out Collide Fleet on OS Query. Uh, it uses SQL-like language, so you can write a query and it will go query that machine specifically and get back with you with the results. Finally is Wazoo, which is pretty much a host intrusion detection system. Um, it's, it, it will detect activities at a host level and also enable additional logging. Now with all these tools, most of these tools, have, if not all, will generate some kind of logs. We will need to get these logs into some kind of aggregator. So that's what we call a SIM. SIM is a place to store all the logs, analyze them, and make some sense out of them. Uh, the most common open source tools, pretty much is Elastic Stack, has been uh, very popular lately and for a long time, actually. Um, check out Helk. 
which is Hunting Elk by Roberto Rodriguez. It's, uh, it's a really nice elastic stack modified version. It has many other components and he also added other abilities to use it, like running your manual queries and joining different data sets together. SOF Elk is also by Phil Hagen from SANS, um, also another really good uh, Elk stack. I really like it because he also added the ability to parse NetFlow data out of the box. So check it out too. And next, another flavor of open source is Greylog. Greylog, so, uh, Greylog is also, also free and the interface for free, I, I prefer the interface for Greylog as I, I think it's more user friendly. And it also uses Elastic Search as the backend. So it's the same backend as Elastic Stack, it's just a different GUI, if you will. And the last option is Splunk. Now, Splunk is commercial, but you can get a free uh, license for up to 500 megs of logs a day. Um, if you haven't checked out Splunk, you know, it, it comes up everywhere. Uh, a lot of job posts have Splunk on them. So this will be a good, really good opportunity to have Splunk deployed and working. Uh, with the SIM, again, think about how you're going to get the data, right? If it's a firewall that you're going to collect from, how are you going to send the data to your SIM? Is it going to be a syslog or are you going to deploy an agent to pull this data? Again, for, for an enterprise level operations, there's going to be a lot of moving parts here that you're going to have to figure out along the journey. And this will give you insights to it. Okay, so some more additional security tools that we can play with. We need, um, if you want to understand the vulnerabilities that you have in your environment, you will need some kind of vulnerability scanner. OpenVAS is an open source vulnerability scanner that you can use. And it's, uh, it's available. Also, another option that I like to use is actually Nessus. They have up to 16 IPs for free. Deploy it, scan your environment, look at the results. If you're an attacker, you're probably already using some of these. If you're a defender, you will see what can you make, what, what sense can you make out of the data that you, you get out of these scanners. As the data, what would you go, how would you go about patching your environment and so on. If malware is your thing, you definitely have to have a sandbox. You can deploy a sandbox in our enterprise. Cuckoo Sandbox is a well-known sandbox and pretty much set it up, deploy it, you send it a file and it allows it for you and it gives you a report. Another good option to have in our blue team toolbox. Finally, honeypots. Honeypots are pretty much traps that you can set up for the attackers that they might trip on. Um, the nice thing about honeypots is we can you know, place them all through our environment. With honeypots, the things to think about is where do you want to place them? What kind of services do you want to have them run? Uh, Teapots is an open source project by T-Mobile, uh, OT Systems. And they, uh, it's about, they have all kinds of services and options running and you should definitely check it out. Another option is think of Canaries. Um, they have a combination of, uh, they have, you can actually do different files and tokens and web uh, honeypots and deploy them throughout the environment and they will alert you over the cloud. So now we have the full picture of our environment. We have deployed the whole thing. We have our attacking, our defending, our infrastructure. Let's talk about what uh, some of the scenarios. So we start off, let's say, from our Kali Linux machine, and we go through our Kali through PFSense, and we compromise a VM, a web server, FTP server, and our DMZ subnet. Now, how can we move to the internal network? And when we move, can the blue team detect this movement? If the, if the blue team did detect this movement, then could they set up alerting on it? 
or why was this movement, why the attack was able to move in the first place? Now, on the flip side, if you are the attacker, how can you bypass this detection? How can you do your attacking, your attack in a different way so you don't alert the blue team? That what it comes down to is pretty much building the truly the purple team at the end where you're 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 defining your visibility ca gaps, you're seeing what you're not detecting on. And you're trying to enhance your logging or your your methods of getting the evidence that you need. At the same time, you're the red team trying to get better and figure out how to move around from a network to another using their tools. And with that, that would conclude my presentation and I welcome your questions. Hey Bashar, thank you very much for your presentation. You do have uh, let me see a couple. One question here says, "How can how can you isolate the internet in the lab so that other people you have training in the range don't accidentally scan the real internet? If you are First, setting up this range for training, so if you set up the range for training, you don't want your um, so let's go back here. You don't want your players to access the internet." Well, if your players are coming from the internet, you can't isolate them, right? Um, if your players are, you know, connecting locally, uh, depending on the range that you're trying to build, uh, if they're local and they're connected directly into your range, they shouldn't need the internet unless if they're going to use Google. Is that what this question is? I think so. It says, how can you isolate the internet so that other people you have training in the range don't? accidentally scan the real internet. I think that's what they're saying. If you have setting up in this range for training. So in, in this range, right, I have my internet zone here. So technically anything behind the PF sense, and let me use a laser pointer. So the when this Kali machine comes in here, it comes it's getting a 198, 160, 192.168.100 that whatever IP address. So anything behind the PF sense the the, uh, the attacker will not know what it is. So I created this internet zone and it's not the internet, it's actually inside my uh, home and inside this virtualization box, but it's being treated as the internet because everything that the PF sense is netted. So the attacker does not know what the IP address or they can't access this box directly, right? They're, they're the, truly the internet and to this PF sense and everything underneath it, if that makes sense. And then I have another question. A person is asking, do you have a deep dive step-by-step -step walkthrough on how you set up your home lab environment? And that is in the works. That's in the works, okay. Yep, I will, I will one day, I'm, I'm not gonna promise, but one day I will release a blog post on how to do it step-by-step. -step. It's a tedious process. Um, and a lot of stuff I did on the fly and I did not document. So I might have to go back and, you know, document and take screenshots and do all that stuff uh, pretty much. But yes, one day I will release it, hopefully. And let me see, where can I find, let me see if there's anything else interesting. Um, we have people saying this was a great presentation. Do you have a blog? I am working on it as we speak again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will release it and uh, follow me on as uh, Leap Bash on Twitter. Uh, and that's where I'll release my blog post and everything else, but I am working on it. Yes. Okay. And will the slides be available at some point? Yes. yes, I will release the slides. Definitely. Okay. And let me see, is there anything else? That looks like it. All right, great, Brashar. Thank you so much. That was very informative. And someone said, where for the slides? You're going to post that? I will put them on my GitHub and I'll put them on Twitter and then I'll post them in Discord. And guys, I'll be on Discord afterwards yes, if you want to talk to me. Sure and ask, yes, I'll be on Discord uh, as Leap Bash as well. So you can ask away.